Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank, and sponsored today by IDERA. Today, Donna will be discussing data modeling and business intelligence. Just a couple of points to get us started. The large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. We very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the top right corner of the screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag LessonsDM. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. Speaking of, you can uh, meet Donna in person at Enterprise Data World 2017 in Atlanta, April 2nd through the 7th, and she'll be starting with a tutorial there on practical steps to implement a metadata strategy. And with that, I will turn it over to Donna. Hello and welcome. Shannon already uh, introduced me. Uh, just a little more of background. I am on Twitter. If anyone follows on Twitter, I'm at Donna Burbank. There's also a hashtag for today. There's always some great conversation about the event, um, and some people like to continue that conversation on Twitter, so please do with that hashtag. Um, I guess the other interesting part of my background for today's uh, conversation is that our sponsor today is Idera. Um, I, for many years, ran their product uh, management for your studio when it was back with Embarcadero Technology, so know that dear and dear and near and dear to my heart, <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about various technologies today. Uh, so moving forward to the topics at hand, as I mentioned, that we have a whole series of data modeling topics this year. Um, if you missed the one on data architecture uh, last month, that was actually very popularly attended um, and got some good online feedback as well. That is all recorded, and then coming up, you'll see we've got a wide range from conceptual data modeling to metadata, which was actually a, a replay from last year. Re re-request from last year um, uh, based on popular attendance. So hopefully you'll join some of the others coming up. Um, but today we'll be talking about particularly data modeling and data modeling in the world of self-service BI and more traditional BI and really how I like to say it, how data modeling is the intelligence behind business intelligence, right? So we're not always at the forefront, we, the data modelers, the forefront of the flashy reports um, that you know, maybe the business user sees, but if you don't have the back end part right with the right business meeting and content, uh, understanding the data structures, your reports aren't going to be as effective. So um, we'll talk a, li a little bit about that uh, moving forward. So here's, I like the slide. I made it, right? <laughs> At least in the U.S., we are oddly uh, fascinated with the idea of the bumper sticker, right? We put these things on our car that we feel very passionate about. And one, if you haven't seen it, um, is if you can read this, thanks, thank a teacher. You know, the idea that if you can read, that a teacher was behind that. And then it's sort of been overtaken by other groups that have musical notes. If you can read this, thank a music teacher and that sort of thing. Well, as I thought about it more, when you think of a nice, clean report or you're doing, you know, self sort of reporting and the data is just nicely formatted, behind that is generally a data modeler, right? Or someone who actually helped build that data in a nice, clean way to make sure the data was correct and that it was architect architected correctly. So in a way, you know, maybe like teachers feel, we're sort of the unsung heroes, um, making others look successful. So um, that's just, a, I thought it was cute, so I put it in there. Um, really, while we're doing this, and, and why I'm still in the industry and still having a lot of fun with it, actually, um, is that I think more than ever, I mean, we've always been data-driven in, in business, but I think business folks are really getting it. I think the technology is, is such that it's more accessible to everybody. And this was just, I just did a quick, you know, some of the top business magazines that we should be familiar with. All are talking about data. Forbes has a data-driven business page. The Wall Street Journal has things about the data-driven business. And if you have been... Live, if you have not been living under a rock, you've probably heard how the data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Uh, 
have my doubts in their definition of that, but it, it is something to be said that, you know, data is now hot and then a lot of people are paying attention to it. And the reason is because we really see the business value. So sort of a corollary to that, we see the rise in self-service business intelligence. I think it makes a lot of sense. A lot of companies want to be more data-driven and they want to get their hands on their own data. I think also a lot of technology, um, has really come a long way to make that possible. Whereas, you know, I think the business people have often and in, in, in the past understood the data and the meaning of the data, but some of the tools were either so complex or they just didn't have access to them that wasn't really feasible. So, you know, some of the drivers of, you know, self, the idea of not only self-service BI, but self-service data prep, um, be it in munging or whatever the vendors, various vendors want to call it. And I have to say the tools are slick. I mean, there is some neat stuff out there and it becomes a lot easier to manipulate data that just took, it would take months in the past and things are a lot easier. Um, there's more data that's more accessible. Um, we'll talk a little bit about you know, things of open data, where you can just go to the web and you know governments and scientific research agencies and things are just publishing the data that's open for you to analyze. Um, and if you're a geek like me, you can waste a lot of time <laughs> doing that. There's some neat stuff out there, or even things like social media. I want to see you know Twitter sentiment, or you know, there's a lot more data available, and I think people are trying to get insights from that. And I think you know business users are becoming more tech savvy. Um, as folks just use technology in their daily life. And I think, to some extent, business users have often been tech savvy. I mean, I've seen some amazing spreadsheets out there and some very complex, um, you know, pivot tables and things like that. And I think a lot of the business users looking at some of these new tools, well, that's not part of it in a spreadsheet. You know, I understand the concept of data manipulation. I just never had the tools before. So that's great, and there's a lot of opportunities, but it can also be fraught with challenges, and you might be facing some of that as well, um, of of the the reports are only as good as the data behind it and is 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 all data accessible in a format that's reportable. So that's a really an opportunity for folks like data modelers and, and the models and the metadata. I'll talk a bit about that a lot today of the metadata behind the models. That really makes the job of business intelligence easier for both the BI professionals um, that might be building the warehouse and generating the canned reports that everyone needs um, or maybe just the casual business intelligence reporting user who just would love to have a trusted data set um, and be able to query it easily if it existed. Um, and I think uh, business users are often frustrated with self-service BI, so you might be wondering about the pictures. But sort of my analogy is, you know, I think they want, and the promise of the tools is there. I have this great tool, and I can slice and dice and do all these fancy uh, reports and, and visualizations. And I, I want it sort of like a salad bar where I decide I want in the salad, and I pick a little bit of lettuce and a little bit of beans and whatever I pick, and it's this beautiful salad. And what we hand them is sort of a shovel and some seeds <laughs> and a watering can. Is that it's, you know, as we know in the data profession, uh, it's hard to get data in a nice, clean format, and, and the end result of the report that people see took a lot of work to get there, either aggregating the data from different sources or you know, making sure you have common master data or reference data sets, et cetera. Um, so I think that's an opportunity for folks in, in the architecture space to build those trusted data sets that folks can use. And I think, you know, often there I've seen in some organizations kind of an us versus them. You know, why are these people getting into our data? Well, <laughs> it's not your data. You might be managing it, but, you know, they, they want to see the data too. So, And they're equally frustrated that they'd like it to be a lot easier. So I think that's where a nice architecture um, that can be easily queried really helps everybody. So here's an example, you know, data is only as good as the metadata, and I kind of, being a self-proclaimed nerd, and I think that's a great thing, don't be offended by nerdery, I think nerdery is a wonderful, wonderful trait, we're the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? So I actually went through this a bit myself and kind of put on the self-service BI person, partly as an excuse to play with some of these tools I've been wanting to spend more time with. Um, so went out, it was actually the UK uh, open data site, and that will be a kind of a fun example to visualize and play with some open data to show how easy it is or, or not easy. And there was one, it was sort of on road safety by vehicles by make and models. So I thought that could be kind of controversial. You know, does a Porsche have more accidents than a, I don't know, than a Ford? <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, I thought that'd be sort of interesting. And this is probably the, very much the experience that the business user might have. That, and that sounded really neat. I just thought I could point one of these self-service BI tools at it and have some great slice and dice pie charts and bar charts. Um, and I open up the data, and it's probably, you know, every data modeler's nightmare. You have the typical field one, field two, field 
through right, there was more. This is what I said. It was like through field one hundred, right? And if you look at the values, it it's not very intuitive. There was no make and model. There's some sort of reference set or reference data set where these numbers mean some sort of make and model of car. And then you have numbers, whatever F10 means. I, I wasn't quite sure, but I, I undaunted went through. I did some great, beautiful reports. Look at the one on the right. I can see that F13 is really great. This 250k. F-13. <laughs> I have no idea what this means. And then I did some more visualizations and found, yep, yeah, F-13 and down there at the bottom is definitely doing something, but I don't know what F-13 is. And that's sort of a very classic metadata problem. To be fair, um, I, I also sort of gave myself a time limit not to, you know, being a busy person, I could spend hour. Actually, I highly recommend if you have some time. A lot of these tools are, or the visualization tools are, you know, downloaded for, for free trials and there's amazing amounts of open data. It is kind of fun to play around. And I, there's the good side of self-service BI and exploration as well that we'll talk about. I, I sort of gave myself 15, 20 minutes, how, how far can you figure it out? And as a business user might, you know, I'm, I'm busy, I just need a report for my meeting. Can I can I get this out quickly? As I went through the data, I did see some insights and I could start to figure out the patterns. And I think that's what a lot of business, you know, data scientists do. Um, so there, there's the pros and cons of that. Sometimes munging through the data, you can find insights. But I didn't have time to find insights. I wanted just a nice, clean report. And even with, you know, understanding trends, I still don't know what F13 is. Um, and, you know, some open data sets are better than others. And not to knock this particular open data set, I mean, some are very clear that I, we're just putting it out there. We don't have time to curate it because, as we know, in this industry, the curating takes time. So most open data sets actually are pretty good, and there are metadata of how it's used and what it's used for, um, and et cetera, et cetera. But I thought this was a good example of, you know, that's great. I can have the best tools on the planet to look at it, but if I don't know what it is, um, you know, fairly data type things, you'll see that well, F2 sort of looks like a year, but they see that as kind of a numeric 2000, 015, et cetera. So you know, just kind of an example of that. And it sort of hits home the point that metadata matters, right? So I think with this, especially with this rise of self-service BI, self-service analytics, more and more attention does need to be paid, for the, paid to the quality and the content and the structure of the data, a.k.a. data models and metadata. And if you look at some of the quotes at the bottom, um, this is a known problem, and you're probably facing it yourself or hearing others complain about this, and it's certainly been being written about that you have a BI professional or a data scientist or a, a, a tech-savvy business user, and they want to get the results, but they're spending 50 to 90% of the time just cleaning the data and reformatting the data. And that little example I went through, I was interested in the result. And I sort of would, were I to have gotten that problem, I would have done more research on what those numbers meant and then probably tried to create some structure behind it and all of that. That would have taken time. I really just wanted to know how many accidents happened by each vehicle time. And to the right, you know, data quality is... It might take 80% of their working day, and that's probably for the data scientist, which is, I know, different from, but closely related to BI. It's the least favorite part of your job. You know, you, you, you want to create these great reports and see these great insights. You probably don't want to, you know, manually change data types or, you know, try to go through and, and see what data means and that sort of thing. You're, you're not getting to the insights you actually want to get to. Um, and that's why they pay us the big bucks in the data model and metadata world, not uh, to fix this sort of thing. Um, and make everybody's job easier. So um, this is a, a bit of a plug for a research paper we did last year, um, but I did think it was um, interesting, some of the insights. We just did a survey on what some of the trends for metadata, which is related to data modeling closely, um, were for for metadata. Um, and you know, who are the users of metadata management? So you'll see here that, no surprise, a very high percentage of the BI reporting team, the data scientists, and business users, who we, we just said business users, we didn't go much deeper than that, but probably the self-service BI or folks that are looking to look more at the data are some of the biggest users and requesters for metadata management, followed closely by data archs and architects and data modelers. And I kind of put that X um a little slightly, because I see those are slightly different. One is the prep and one is the cons consumation, <laughs> consumers of. Um, and then you'll see the DBAs and de developers are actually close related as well. So, I mean, it is something that having good metadata and a good model and a good structure really does help everybody. And I think the more people look at the data, they're sold on that idea pretty quickly. That, wow, if someone could just structure for this, structure this for me very easily, my life would be easier. If you could tell me what the data meant, that would be helpful as well. So, um, if you look at sort of the classic 
you know, even with the rise of, of self-service BI, I think we kind of hit that point home, is that, you know, you can you can find insights on data, but it's a lot easier uh, to find insights on data that's been managed and, and manipulated and, and cleansed for you. And there's certain use cases for this concept of a data warehouse. I, I know the industry loves to create controversy and say things like, is, da is data warehousing dead? Now we have Hadoop. And, and don't get me started, right? I probably <laughs> have vented enough on some of those things on other, um, other webinars. But, you know, there's a use case uh, for each technology. And I think the idea of having, you know, even in an organization that's very driven on on discovery and, and innovation through data scientists and looking at raw data sets within and out of things. Most companies have something that needs to be, you know, your financial reporting, for example. It needs to be curated. It has a lot of um, volume. We need to manage it to be more effective in the data warehouse. You know, there may be innovations in how we format the data warehouse or how we populate it or what the source systems are, but that concept of managing the most important data in your business, I don't see going away. Um, and again, my little phrase where the intelligence behind business intelligence story may kind of explain that. So you might have your average business user saying something that seems so simple. Could you just show me all customers by region? Uh, could I maybe have that report by this afternoon? And I don't think, you know, well, I think more and more business people do understand the complexity of data, but often that doesn't seem like a hard request. But to think to get that, you, know, you have hundreds, dozens, thousands of source systems that probably have customer data. Something as simple as what's the definition of customer? How is this stored? Each data store probably has a different structure. Who's the owner or steward of that data? Do we truly understand what that source system means? Is this sales calling it a customer that might be actually a prospect? And is it you know finances calling it a customer who actually owns our product? You know, all of this difficulty that we need to understand the source systems and then put into data warehouse for A, doing that you know, ETL or the transformation or the munging of, of getting all that data conformed and then as well as thinking of things like performance or, you know, things like a dimensional model. I know that's not the only way to do a data warehouse, but it's a common one to really focus on, I'm going to use this data for reporting. And then for reporting, you need to model, you know, what are the definitions of these key business? What do I mean by total sales? What do I mean by region? Is that, you know, is, is I don't know, North America, Canada, and the U.S.? Is it just Canada, U.S., Mexico? You know, a lot of the different subtleties in how we define regions. Um, and how do I make it sure it's efficient and, and reporting correctly? Um, so this is probably your classic, you know, from source to transformation to warehouse to target to the, the information on your BI report. And I really see a data model kind of hitting every step of the way there. So I would, you know, we've talked a bit about that idea of almost old school, new school, right? There's this idea of, there's so much open data, the tools have come such a long way, people want quick insights. Do we even need modeling anymore? Are we just getting in people's way? And I think, of course, yes, we still need model, but I think there is the balance of modeling what matters and, and have this idea of a trusted data set. And I, I have worked with a lot of organizations recently, actually, that are struggling with this in something like a data governance program. And, and I think there's only conflict when, when we don't actually spell it out and see what we're trying to do. So I think it's managing what you need to manage um, and leaving it alone where people really just need to explore. So, you know, I'm just trying to look. I, we launched a product for marketing. I know that the results of that marketing campaign, when I send it to, up to management, we're going to report on the street or whatever, those financial numbers need to be super accurate. But I just want to get some Twitter sentiment analysis to see, we just launched yesterday, what are people saying, and get some trends. Leave me alone. I don't need a whole lot of governance around that. I want to actually go look at the, the Twitter streaming data and, and see what's out there. So you don't want to hamper people's creativity or hamper, you know, the right tools for the right job. Um, but you do where there does need to be a set. Think of that example. I, want, I found something on Twitter, what customer said this, well, I hope there's a master list of our core set of customers, and I hope there's a reference data set for the different regions. And I, and I think you won't get too much argument around that. I noticed a lot of the companies I've been working with that do want to be much, very much on the right and do, you know, they might have a um, cloud-based data lake where it's all, you know, innovation, but I think as soon as people start to look 
and to do some of this exploration, they'll say, if I just had a nice clean reference set, I could compare some, some, you know, some of this against. And if there were a master data list when I need it, I think that's a win-win for both parties. So for me, it's just understanding what does need to be modeled and then what doesn't, um, you know, allow that to be what it is and do the exploration. And the real value of that report is when you can compare both of those together. So what are the customer trends? How does that relate to my specific customers? You know, what are the trends by region and how do I define a region? You know, all of these different things that need to integrate with the report um, can, be, can be done with that balance. So I think that's an important point to make, and, and, and I sort of get annoyed when, you know, I think it's all, got a lot of media and that sort of thing are trying to get, you know, clicks, right? So they try to create controversy that one is better than the other or one is going away, and, you know, they're all they're all good. <laughs> I live in Boulder, which is kind of a hippie town. It's a common phrase. It's all good. Um, it's all just the right tool for the right job and making sure the touch point in integration has made sense. So uh, the other thing to remember is the different modeling levels, and I tend to show this a bit uh, often in the presentations I give, but whenever I leave it out, we kind of wish we had this to refer back to. So just when we're talking about modeling, there's different levels. So you might be at the conceptual model level where really you're just talking at very high-level business terms, definitions, what do I mean by customer? What do I mean by product or region? And that's super important as we're looking at a report because if we don't have common agreement when we say what are total sales by customer and what do we mean by a customer? Is it a current customer, past customers, you know, gold level customers? Then your report is meaningless. So especially with BI, that high level conceptual model makes sense. You know, the logical, um, that's more, it's still, you're talking about the business, but you're adding some different rules about it. You're adding some attributes. What are the attributes of customer, name, address? Um, and when we talk about star schema, that we're talking, you know, a little more about what I'm going to report upon. Uh, so you're getting a little more detailed, but the focus should be my business goals and objectives. And then the physical is really at the physical ta database table level where either you're doing an inventory of my current sources or you're creating a new source and really trying to optimize for performance and that sort of thing. So on that conceptual level, I mean, business meeting and context, I, I think I touched upon, is so critical. So again, the business person might ask what seems to be such a simple question, just show me all my customers by region, and a good data architect dreams and gets excited about this sort of thing and asks all these questions that other folks may think were strange. But once they start understanding, I don't think they'll think it's strange at all. You know, the, does this include current customers or just lapsed customers? How do you find a region? Can you kind of customer have a billing address in more than one region? So maybe you were billed in one region, but you purchased in another. What do you mean by region? You know, all this type of stuff. When you really want to make sure that a report is correct, you need to think about that. Or, you know, we're thinking we're in the age of compliance and things like GDPR or, you know, personal privacy is a big deal for folks. Um, we have customer information. Should I offer skate or hide some of the PII. I, do you want trends of customers by region? I, I really can't show you customer names by region. That's sort of invading people's privacy, right? So there's a lot to think about on just a simple thing like show me all my customers by region. And that's where a data model comes in or at least the rigor of that type of questioning that we tend to do in data modeling. And this is a cartoon that I tend to use a lot, but you know, there just aren't a lot of cartoons about data models. So even though it's really not that funny, um, <laughs> I use it because, you know, it's a data modeling cartoon and there just aren't enough of them. But I think if you have been in this business, you might find it funny. Is that, you know, I'm, we're here, we're all done with user acceptance testing and everything looks great. We're about to roll out this new marketing application. Just one question, what was the customer? What do you mean by customer? And that, you know, might seem kind of strange, but I've been in groups where we haven't been clear about customer and it might have been that we're only looking for online customers and not brick and mortar customers and the whole campaign we built makes no sense anymore because nobody ask those basic questions at the beginning. So that's why we always like to have a data modeler in the room or an architect um, to ask those sort of questions. And I have seen more and more companies really sort of get that. And, and even, you know, I've been in, uh, worked with some companies that might be a product development. You know, they might be developing tires or, you know, and they have kind of, I guess what we would call agile or scrum meeting type of thing of, of you know, the product launch meeting. And more and more, there's a data person in the room. That how is this decision going to affect data? Well, this, do we need more information to report upon? Um, and I don't, I think that probably all always happened to some extent, but I'm here having it happen more. And that I know some of my customers were never in those meetings until the past year. And I think now more and more people are getting of we can't wait till the end of our sales cycle or our product launch or our campaign or our whatever and then start thinking about the data. You need to think about it in the beginning. 
Um, so uh, here's an example of a conceptual data model. Um, in this particular tool, one of the things I, I like it about it is that it just uh, hides all of the detail and really just focuses on the business definitions because each each of those model levels has a purpose, and the purpose of conceptual data modeling is really to get that communication. So this could, you know, it seems very simple, but right, you know, quickly a person could look at that and say, okay, a customer is a person or organization who's rented a move. Wait a minute, we don't sell to organizations; we just sell to individuals. So right there, that could be a big business change or, you know, business clarification that we needed just by showing it clearly on, on a diagram. Because the data model metadata, both technical and business, can be used by a lot of different roles. So it could be just as something as simple from the, the business person in finance. What do we mean by regional sales? How do we find regions? Is it by geographic region, sales region, political region? You know, a lot of different discussions there. Um, I might be a data architect and I'm, I'm trying to build something new, but is there an approved data structure for storing customer data? I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So if you can make my life easier and give me something that exists, thank you. That would make my job easier and might as well have a standard. Um, you know, it could be an auditor They're looking at your report saying, please not, not just verbally tell me how total sales was calculated. I absolutely need to see the lineage. And any of you in the financial industry know that, you know, there's regulations around this that you can't just say, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I actually need to show and show that data lineage of, of how that data was calculated. Um, again, you might be building a data warehouse and I, I need to understand those source to target mappings, to how that data was created. Or, you know, I've seen companies use data models in the business repine at something like HR and I'm trying to get my staff up to new at the speed on the company's new business terminology. And if you've done a data model, especially at the conceptual logical level, a lot of it is. Do we call this a client or a member or a customer or, you know, how do we term these things? And it's really the, the lingo and, and the way the company does business. So I have had seen companies use a data model or a version of it. it might be turned into a glossary or some have used the model itself at a high level because it kind of shows the relationships. And we have a customer with a care representative, which is different than your sales rep or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it really can help non-technical people as well. So another thing you can do when you're doing these data model levels um, is this idea of kind of map or show the lineage between them. So it could be something like, you know, you know especially with things like regulations or a report, you know, I have this concept of client on my report. Um, where did that come from? Well, you know, in logical model, we might use the term customer for that. I know you guys say client, but in our world, it's customer because in all the different tables, Oracle calls it cost, and Teradata calls it customer, and DB2, it's C table underscore 16. Um, and being able to see that lineage of, you know, where where is all my customer data and how is it used? And this is just showing it at the very high entity level, but you can do the same thing, especially when we're thinking of reporting, um, down to the attribute level, the business term or the core data element or, you know, whatever you call it, the metric. Um, to really see what what do I mean and where is this data stored. Um, so the other part on the physical level, um, really that's your kind of active inventory of your data assets, and this isn't insignificant. So one of it is just knowing what data you have. Um, so think of that example where the the, I sort of tease him, but the naive business user that just says, "Give me a, give me a list of customers by region by this afternoon," and we don't have anything in place. You know, customer data could be in thousands of sources uh, across the organization. And one of the nice things about a data model is most of the data modeling tools can sort of point the data model to these sources and create a picture like you see in the middle automatically. Um, and there's been some amazing aha moments of, wow, I didn't know that we had this data or this data structure. Um, and then when you start in a model repository, you can start to do some impact analysis off that of, oh, these 16 tables all all use uh, the same data type, I mean, the same data element, for example. Uh, know what data you're mean. So once you have the data models, you can link it to that logical or conceptual model, either top down, bottom up, or some sort of mix between. But then the beauty of that is that your business requirements are linked to your actual technical infrastructure. And then it can support data consistency. So in this example that we might have, you know, reverse engineered a hundred databases and we see that the date field is stored differently. It's a character field in some, it's a date field in others. You actually start to create these you know, standards or business rules, the technical rules, you know, maybe dates should always be in a date field. And then when you do new development or you want to go back and clean up your databases, you can use, do that from the model. Uh, so you have kind of these core standards that kind of make the data more consistent. Um, you know, think back to my example of the open data where they had a date field as a, look, look like a numeric, um, 
didn't make any sense. So if we can just get that stuff out of the way, so that's that you don't even think about that. You know, a date should be a date. And when you're doing the reports, that's just not, you know, ideally the business person would never even know that was an issue. It was just as nice and clean. Um, and then it adds that context and definition. I kind of already mentioned that. But, you know, the uh, the beauty of, you know, some folks might say, well, I have all that stuff in my da database and I'm only using Oracle and, you know, I kind of know the data structures. I'm a DBA. I get that. But most data modeling tools can add a lot of metadata around it. Um, I, I talked last year in the metadata section. They can almost be sort of metadata repository light in a way. If you're only using it for a very focused set, especially around things like BI, you can add a lot of either tags or fields or, you know, whatever the tool calls it. Um, so you can have, uh, whether this is a required field, whether there's some business rules around it, whether it's private or secret, you can add a lot of context around data um, that might not have been known. Or, or simple things, you know, city. What do I mean by city? That seems very obvious. Uh, everyone knows what a city is, but in this context, is it the city where the customer lives or where they purchased it in the store where it was located? Again, if I'm doing a report and I want to see sales by region, that is a big deal. It could be that I live in New York, but I was visiting London and bought this pair of shoes. So what does that mean by sales by region, you'd think? I would think that would be a London sale. Um, but again, that's something the business needs to define. Um, and then this is just another example of that. So, um, you know, technical metadata, that's almost your DDL there on the left, um, where it actually would be your DDL. So a lot of the tools can, you know, forward engineer as well. So I create my standards in the modeling tool and kind of forward engineer that onto a platform. And, and the nice thing is that that's linked to your actual business data. What, what does an employee mean? What does a customer mean? And then, oh, as we know, that's separate from your actual data, but not really. And especially when we think of things like personal privacy, it's always good to remember there's actually a person named John Smith that we're sending this reporting about or sending a marketing campaign to. Um, you got to keep that in mind. So here's another uh, data worsening example. We kind of showed it as kind of the classic source to target mapping to generate a report. But I thought this part was uh, interesting in that it really shows where data modeling hits just about every step of the way. So if you sort of start at the right, um, where a lot of folks, if I'm looking at a report, might focus, you know, I'm looking at my sales report, right? I want to know total sales by region. I might be using some sort of BI tool or self-service BI. Generally, uh, often, um, that's sourced from something like a data warehouse, where to build that, um, hopefully you'll have this either in the modeling tool or separate. There's something, you know, business glossary. What do I mean by customer? There's probably, we'll talk a bit more about a dimensional data model to set it up in sort of cubes and, and easily report so that you can generate an easy, a, a nice report, you know, total sales by region, by sales rep, by whatever. Um, and then there's the physical tables behind that uh, that generate the report. So that's kind of a lot. And the nice thing about data model is that they, they have all of that right there in the in the tool. So there was probably, um, you know, go, going jumping to the other side, that report that might say total sales by region, a very simple uh, summary might be that maybe there was three databases that this came from. One was an Oracle, one on SQL Server, one on DB2, one calls customer, customer, one calls the cus table. You know, I think I've hit that point home enough, but yeah, they're all named different things. So you'd have some sort of physical data models, <laughs> multiple, um, that would understand that and understand that context. And then generally there's some sort of staging area that cleans this up and there's ETL tools in between it that kind of do source to target mappings. Well, at each stage of the game, there's some sort of physical model describing these areas. And many of the tools in the market now can actually start to document some of these source to target mappings and these, I really messed up this picture, um, these lines in between it um, as well. So what, what's nice is that these tools um, can really start to see that lineage and link it to a sales report. There's also um, tools in the market now, I and mean, because the space is fairly mature and this use case is fairly mature, most tools on all sides um, have some sort of common metadata exchange so that, for example, I have the structure in my warehouse and I want to import it into the BI tool I can or definitions or the lineage behind. The integration and the metadata flow between these goes very well. So again, you might store it in a separate metadata repository. You might store some of this in the modeling tool, some of it in the BI tool itself, but they all are nowadays fairly well integrated. So you can kind of see that, that flow, which is nice. 
So, did one of you I just mentioned, um, this is actually a screenshot from Idira that uh, shows the lineage from kind of the source to the target, um, and you can put the business rules in there. So, what's nice is this is, you know, this isn't, probably, you know, this, this is more at the business level to understand the meeting, right? Because more and more people are using modeling tool to kind of see that pure. This isn't, you know, replacing an ETL tool by any means, um, but it's kind of showing you what's happening as I move between the address table and the staging area for address, right? Can I just visualize that? Because most modelers and, and most people, I would argue, are visual creatures. So it's really hard. Uh, you, you might have written the script and you can see the script and you get what that script is doing. But for me, and I think for most people, to kind of see that movement as a flow in a visual line, I mean, that's what modeling is all about. So a lot of the tools now do have lineage as part of that. So why should we model the warehouse? So I think I've, I've hit home enough the idea of kind of the business rules behind it, understanding the lineage, um, but also just the ease of use and the speed of access. So as I was trying to create a, a unpleasant reporting situation for myself to show an example in these tools, um, I also tried to just not think at all about um, how I constructed my query. And you know, put you know, 17 rows and columns and mix them together and sort of a, a um, fictitious but similar, you know, computer report, last time four days, 10 hours, 27 seconds. These reports, if not queried correctly or you know, the SQL isn't written correctly or the underlying structure isn't such that it can be easily queried and can be a nightmare. So I will say that a lot of these tools have gone a long way. The one I was using wouldn't let me do it. It kept saying, um, Warning, <laughs> you can't, this is going to last a long time, which is why I had to make up a fake um, little error message there. But I remember in the, probably not the highlight of my career as I was writing bad SQL myself, um, I, I did some embarrassing things like that as I was learning uh, about joins and what not to join um, and how not to structure a table. Um, but that is a beauty of a warehouse that I think has been forgotten. I don't have it in this presentation, but I've, I've shown it in others. One of my favorite stories is Facebook that actually stood up at a TDWI conference um, it's just sort of like a big confession, the, you know, the, the ruler of the big data space and a lot of the new analytics was sort of admitting that they had built a data warehouse. And, and one of the reasons was not only the, un, their understanding was what, what do we mean by, they were trying to find out how many current users were logged in at once. What do we mean by a current user? You know, if I'm on Spotify, am I a user of Facebook, even though I'm logged into, you know, that sort of thing. But the main reason was performance and they had tried to do a similar warehouse on Hadoop and it, it just was taking, you know, days to get the performance back. And I think the same report, you know, was 40 minutes or something uh, with a warehouse. So, you know, performance is something that I think often gets overlooked as we're thinking about some of these technologies for reporting. Um, and then, again, if you really want that high-quality data and an integrated set of data, I mean, that is part of the reason we model, because as you look at these data sources, you can see the overlapping data types, understand the technical integration, and also kind of the business meaning. So, you know, all this work we put in is for a reason, um, to make it easier on the on the reporting side. So. Oh, one, if I, I, this is not, as you've noticed, sort of a how-to on how to data model for the warehouse. There's a lot of material out there already, um, but if this is absolutely new to you, I thought this might be sort of helpful just to kind of, you know, set the stage a little bit. So one common way, and I know not the only way, to model a data warehouse is kind of the star, star schema or dimensionally modeling, which is kind of the, the Kimball. There's the Kimball versus Inman, and this is the Kimball way. Um, but one way I like to kind of think about it is, and apologies for anyone who's a gram. Marian or grammar person on the call, um, but what are you reporting by, right? So I'm reporting by by month, by product, by sales, by, um, by sales rep, for example, and that's really what's going to be your dimension. So the thing in the middle, the fact, is what I'm what I'm reporting upon, um, and then the things around the star are kind of what I'm I'm reporting by, and that's probably the easiest way to think about it. Um, and a little different, you know, the lines and the star schema type model are really, you know, your navigation paths for the reporting. It's, it's similar, but slightly different from when we're doing a logical model for, you know, uh, or more of a relationship, a relational OLTP, you know, can a customer have more than one account? I'm kind of creating business rules around that. Not so much here. It's really to try to get that reporting structure. Um, so, again, it's kind of a summary of that so that the, the fact, again, that's going to be the thing we're reporting about. So what are my sales figures? Generally, you know, it's not we have tons of out at, these are very deep tables. So you'll have a lot of values, um, but not as many attributes. And the dimensions, you might have a lot of attributes, but few values is kind of a 
hand wave generalization over that. But really the facts are these are my sales figures for the year. You know, and then how do I report sales by month? How do I report sales by region? And in a lot of ways you can roll these up and, and do different uh, versions of this, but this is probably your simplest view of, of the star schema, as we call it. Um, and, and data modeling tool. And again, it's not everybody uses the data modeling tool for a star schema. Um, you know, people can just build that right in the database and then report upon it. One of the nice things about using a data modeling tool, partly, well, many reasons, but one is this nice way to visualize it. So you can literally see the star in the middle, I mean, the fact in the middle and the dimensions around it. And then all of the attributes, you know, can be defined and you can get all of the benefits of using a data modeling tool around it. So, so quickly summarize. So, uh, you know, this idea of the data-driven business is, is really increased the need for everything in data in data world, which is great. Which is why um, I'm having a lot of fun lately, <laughs> doing a lot of the new things with data. Um, but it's also increased just the demand for BI reporting, which has been around for a while, but I think is in more and more demand, particularly the self-service aspect. Um, but as I hope we've shown that the BI reporting really is only as good as the underlying metadata and the structures and the quality. So again, a lot of the reporting tools are great, um, but they can only be as good as the, qual the data underneath it. And data models specifically, you know, are critical for understanding the meaning of the data, um, making the data reporting process easier and improving performance, and really critically when we're talking about something like a warehouse, you know, understanding those source and target systems and the lineage and how you get that right. As you know, that that's a, a big task. And having a model where you can rationalize that and visualize that makes a big difference. And again, just to remind, uh, kind of what we talked about is that modeling what matters. Modeling and metadata are great. They're not the only way to deal with data by any means. Um, not all data needs to be modeled, uh, so do allow for this you know, kind of exploration or I'm just doing a quick report or, you know, not everything needs the rigor that we'd like to give, you know, the core data structures. And that, that's often where we start in a project is really identifying what those core things are. Cause to use a well-worn phrase, you don't want to boil the ocean, right? But if you can start with the stuff that matters, um, then that's key. Um, there's me if you want to contact me after with any questions or anything I had mentioned um, after the fact, a little bit about my company. We do this for a living, so if you need help, let us know. Um, a little call out for data diversity training sessions. So there is, if you're interested in metadata, we have a course online um, about metadata management specifically. Um, and there's other courses as well from some of my colleagues um, that are great on data quality and data governance. So you might want to check that out uh, just for further education. Um, a little call out to the Lessons in Data Modeling series. So the next one is going to be on conceptual data modeling and either how to get the attention of business users um, or if you are a business user, what the heck is data modeling and how can I get started and what makes sense for me to know about that data modeling. And then you'll see we have a variety of topics as data modeling is becoming more and more popular as according to data diversity, that's one of their most requested topics. So we're trying to mix it up and hopefully keep it in interesting. Um, so at this point, um, I'd be happy to open it up to questions and thoughts, ideas, anything you'd like to share and I'll, I'll let you coordinate that, Shannon. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. Always such a pleasure. Um, and just to answer the most common questions we receive, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of this session, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Um, so we've got lots of great questions coming in, Donna, so I'm just going to dive right in here. What is um, your view on the impact of big data on data modeling? Um, I think the impact of big data on data modeling, I sort of uh, talked about this several levels. So there's the, a bit of the hype that anything new has to replace the old, um, which again could be a full rant that I will refrain from. Um, but I think uh, one of the famous speakers, you know, the tyranny of, um, I'm going to mess it up. The tyranny of or and the beauty of and, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, you don't need one or the other. I think they both uh, work well together. Um, I think big data fits in a lot with kind of what we were saying in some of that explore, exploration mode. Um, and so, you know, I, I maybe just need all my sensor data and I need um, a massively 
performant and less expensive way to store it. I might put that in something like a Hadoop or even a you know cloud source. Um, I am seeing more customers trying to, rather than have it on different places, doing some um, data warehousing on a big, big data pla- You know, Big data means a lot of different things, but if we're thinking of, say, like a Hadoop platform, there are hive structures. There, there's a way to do relational databases, and because what they're seeing is, you know, when you're looking at the type of report for a financial report, you still have to do that rigor. So it's really the usage of big data, but again, I guess I would summarize it by just saying, know what you need to model, what you don't. So if I'm really just getting sensor stream data and, and, and needing to get the statistics off that, don't really need to model that. But if I'm doing my financial reports for a BI report, I certainly should. So. Yeah, we had another question that was just along the same lines, you know, and specifically, you know, you know, as it relates to the, um, you know, big data relates to the non-relational, the NoSQL databases. Um, so, yeah, I would say for so I, again, it's it's kind of the fit for purpose. I was I was uh, thinking back if I had a slide on it. You might also want to catch. I think it was last for those interested in the big data. It was last was it December or no October? I think we did a big data data modeling uh, webinar, which I think is still on recording. So you might want to catch that as well. Um, but yeah, so for particularly for uh, data warehousing, I'm sort of a fan of the relational you know, table structures, because I think you can do a lot with that, and a lot of the rigor behind those is good. But, you know, when we're talking about performance, or I'm trying to do, I don't know, uh, real-time, you know, shopping cart for my online system, then I think, you know, some of these NoSQL databases can be excellent. But it's really, to me, a different use case. Um, although, at the conceptual level, we just still know what we mean by customer, right, and, and some of those. But I, I think, again, I just think fit for purpose. Um, I think modeling still stays, but modeling for some of those NoSQL platforms is still kind of evolving and NoSQL is huge as well. So kind of, you know, some of the document databases, for example, are a little easier to model. They're kind of set up for that. But something like a key value pair is kind of more of a thing relates to thing, right? So kind of a broad topic, but I would point you first to that um, webinar, and then we'll be talking uh, more about that, I think, later this year as well. Sure, yeah, we do have that published in our on-demand uh, webinar section on Dataversity, and I include a link to that to everyone um, out in the follow-up email. So, um, you know, what about data privacy? If I'm a paying customer, why is my usage being manipulated? I already paid, and I don't want a, my personal characteristics to be used. Where do you opt out of being used for data modeling? Um so I think privacy is a huge uh, driver uh, for a lot of this, and I think data modeling helps with that. So I think um, early on I had in one of my examples when they said, show me all the data about my customer, and that was one of the questions the data architect said of we need to consider PII. So just just clarification, when we're talking about modeling here, we're thinking of modeling the data structures. We're not talking about sort of doing uh, statistical kind of big data modeling on, you know, purchasing patterns and that kind of thing is sort of a different kind of modeling. But I think exactly that's where uh, data modeling can come in, is that I can say, these are all the attributes I know about customer. Um, you know, I, I might sign up for a product. They're going to know my name. They're going to know my credit card information if I purchased a product. Um, but I need to ensure that when I put my credit card information, only the people who know, need to know to see that to make the transaction see it. That should not cascade um, across the organization. So I'm seeing that a huge driver for um, for data modeling, and I guess it also ties back to the question on data modeling for big data, so that I want to move a bunch of data off to the cloud. Well, what is that data? I'm not going to put my PCI or my PII unless I can absolutely know that this is tokenized. And, and so a lot of my customers are spending a lot of time on that very question and using a data model to help track that. So I have 100 attributes about a customer. It's fine for marketing to use these you know, 17, but don't use these 20. Um, you know, if this is a generic thing, but we have 10 customers who are interested in skiing, you know, that's fine. But we don't want to know that Donna Burbank is, you know, a skier. That's kind of goes too far. So, yeah, very <laughs> relevant to PII. If I am a skier, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say that, but, you know, I don't really want a marketer knowing that or I'll get a bunch of ads about skiing. <laughs> well, you know, data privacy, of course, leads right into data governance. So, you know, looking at the three levels of modeling, where do you see the Data Governance Council or work groups as an audience? Um, well, it sort of just depends on how you define your work groups, but I think all of them to a certain extent. Um, 
I was going to try to see if I can just go back to that slide so everyone's talking about the same one. Um, so uh, again, I see often uh, the Data Governance Council is often made up of, of business people, and it should be. So I think in that sense, a conceptual model is excellent, and I think a lot of the discussion I've found that's been super helpful in some of these governance councils is, you know, what do I mean? And it's always it's always amazing to me when you go to a, a company, you know, it sounds like that would be the most obvious thing. What do I mean by sales date? Or what do I mean by account closure? Or what do I mean by something that from the outside world would seem pretty obvious is when you close the account. But there's so many subtleties in the business that I think that that conceptual model um, is where that can be very helpful to people to understand that because it's not always the definition of the data itself, but it's often the relationships with how it relates to something and that often can be an aha moment. Oh, you're talking about the customer that relates to the support rep. I'm talking about the customer that relates to the customer care rep. We call those different things. Um, so I think the conceptual level can be very helpful as you get down to the logical and that's, I guess that's the business side of the logical as well. Uh, sometimes you need to get to that level of detail. I think the physical too, I think on the council should be some technical folks and often they'll raise their hand and say, yeah, I know that's what you want for the business. We, we can't, we don't store it that way or we can't store that data or, you know, that's PCI, we can't put it in this platform or et cetera, et cetera. So I think a, a council that works well um, is a bit of both. I think often a lot of the big aha moments are at the conceptual level, um, but you kind of need someone who knows the physical to keep it real <laughs> of, you know, have you thought of this? Uh, this is how we need to implement it or it's not going to be a performant or for, for, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all of the layers, but hopefully that clarified. Well, I have a, uh, a couple of different questions which play off that. Um, uh, you know, can you speak to the difference between, while we're on the slide specifically, can you speak to the difference between a data field element and entity with respect to the three levels of modeling? So that was a, a field, an entity, and what was the other one? Uh, element. Um, so I'm going to jump to another one to answer that. So yeah, I would say, what do they say? The cobbler's children um, has no shoes. <laughs> and I think as an industry, we're terrible about using the same term um, for different things. <laughs> um, they're a different term for the same thing. Um, so what one person calls an element, someone might call something else. Maybe this one might be a little uh, better to show. So if you have a customer, and this picture, to me, this is a, almost a relational table. Uh, the customer, to me, would be the entity. And then in kind of data modeling world, the data field would be the first name, last name. A lot of folks call those an element. Um, some people have a more generic concept of a, a business data element. So maybe my business data element is social security number, um, and that's just a generic business term, uh, element. And then that's a key element, and we need to know that's P. PII information, and that might link to one or more logical models where it might be social security number and one, SSN and a number, and that kind of thing. And then it's actually implemented as a field um, and different database tables. So kind of linked, I would say the only thing that's very different in my mind on that is generally an entity, which I see as kind of a superset of those things called elements and fields and attributes and kind of at that granularity, but they kind of have a different use case. And each tool and each vendor calls it something different, but that's generally there's kind of a business element or a business term, a logical data attribute, and then kind of some database field is kind of a common one. So I think that helped. Indeed. And, you know, going back to the previous question, you had mentioned physical models. Um, the question is, doesn't star schema model consider as a physical model as that's how data is stored in tables? Yes. Yes, but I want to make my case, and, and and some of the vendors will even argue that you know there's only a physical model. So yes, I would say this is uh, one of the ideas of a of a star scheme is for that performance, and this is how your database would look. I'm a big fan of of those starting with more of a a demand, um, either conceptual and or logical as well, because if we're to get back to that. A, if I'm trying to work with a business user and I'm saying, this is what your report's going to look like, you're going to do sales by month, by region, by product. And then you probably have those questions, what I mean by product. Not a bad idea to do it at a conceptual level as well. Um, but yes, at its core, most people think of the STAR schema as a physical implementation of the way you're reporting upon and creating cubes from. But I think there's a place for thinking of it at the logical and conceptual level too. Oh, there's so many great questions coming in. You know, if we don't have time to get to them all, just keep them coming in. I'll get them over to Donna. We'll see what we can do to get some additional answers for you. 
Um, I just love this engagement from our attendees. It's awesome. Um, some might argue that with a dedicated metadata repository, the inventory of data assets is already available. But I have yet to see a metadata repository that can effectively give the visual presentation a modeling tool typically can. Can you comment on that? Um, I, I would agree, and there is that, that overlap of, of what goes in the repository, what can be done in a data modeling tool, and there is some valid overlap. But part of the, well, part of the value of a data model is the process and the iteration and the visualization. So I'm building a model and I'm trying to understand, you know, I, I have a customer and I have a payment and we call a payment a, a voucher and we, we change that and we can visualize it and it's more active and, and use, used. Um, and I, I, I like that representation of a, a model in the, yeah, showing the attributes, showing that I think the question earlier that was kind of talking about elements and um, fields and how they relate, I often will build a lot of that in a data model first and then import that into a metadata, if, if a, my customer is using a metadata repository, import it in. Because I think there is a unique perspective. It's not the only perspective, but it's a unique one that a data model offers and kind of seeing those layers and linking them together and getting the full view of this is my conceptual view of what a customer is. Um, and, and we're going to decide that. We're going to create standards around that. And I, I personally, I'm biased that I, I kind of like the view of a data model. I will say a lot of metadata repositories have come a long way too, and, and I think sometimes their lineage is, is going to be better, but that's what they're meant for. I mean, they're doing a superset of not only data models. So that you could probably argue any source system that they get, a lot of these repositories can get JavaScript and COBOL and, you know, as well as data models. So they're, you know, they're getting anything that's more generic is, you know, a lot of the, the Java program is going to like their format better in their Java program, right? So that's kind of by definition they're going to do something more generically. Hopefully that rant made some sense. I'm not sure it did. <laughs> Indeed. And I think we have time to slip in one more question here. But, again, keep the questions coming in. We've got so many great ones. Um, I'll get those over to you. Uh, what is What is your view on the role of subject area definition model and conceptual data modeling? Oh, oh, someone there. I thought you asked that, but they probably know to set me off on a rant. Um, but I won't. So a lot of people call the conceptual model the same as the subject area model. And in my book uh, on the second page here, Data Modeling for the Business, which is on, I will say, I'll say it because I'm the only one of two other authors, uh, it's on conceptual modeling. And between the three of us, to that note of cobbler's children, you know, don't have shoes. Um, we couldn't agree on what we would call. So, see Steve Holberman, who's a lovely gentleman and very, very, very intelligent. He called it a subject area model. Um, I called it a conceptual model. Chris Bradley, my other um, co-author, called it a conceptual model. And Steve's very persuasive, and he's the publisher, so he won. And we just decided to call it a high-level model. Just to keep, let's not argue about what we call it. Uh, we did do a survey just because I must be competitive, and people proved me right. Right. Most people call it a conceptual model. The reason I don't like it called a subject area model, partly because a lot of the tools have things called a subject area that are kind of a different thing. Um, whereas I, I think of a, I think of a conceptual model as concepts. I have a customer and a product, and a subject area would be an area of it could be my finance subject area where you group many of those together. But I don't worry about it as long as someone does it. But that's my my color commentary on that. I, often people see them as the same thing. I see them as slightly different. I love it. Well, Donna, thank you so much for this amazing presentation today. And again, thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the questions. Keep them coming in. Like I said, I'll get some any of the unanswered questions over to Donna. Uh, and just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email uh, by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides, links to the recording, um, and I'll get the additional uh, big data recordings um, in there as well so you can go back and look at those uh, in addition. So thank you, everyone for attending today. Donna, thank you so much for, for your time today, and I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks to IDEA for, um, for sponsoring today, enabling us to make it all happen. We appreciate and it. I'll just do one call out because there were so many questions I did put my contact. So if someone wants to, if, if it's not in your list and they want to reach out to me personally, they feel free to do that as well. Awesome. I love it. And that will likewise be in the, in the follow-up email. So, Alrighty. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.